All right, so good morning. My name's Dr. Paul Mason, and today I'm going to present on femoroacetabular impingement, otherwise known as FAI. So FAI is primarily a problem that develops during adolescence, primarily those who play sport. In fact, 90% of adolescents with FAI do in fact play sport. And it's a concern because even though it's a condition that develops in the young, the consequences persist as you get older, primarily osteoarthritis of the hip. So there's two main subtypes of FAI. Firstly, we have a pincer lesion, which is characterised by basically a deep acetabular socket. And the other is a cam lesion, which basically is a bump that reflects a loss of sphericity of the femoral head. And there's also a mixed variety that contains features of both. But in isolation, these bony changes are not sufficient for a diagnosis of FAI. In addition to the presence of these bony changes, which we can see on imaging, we also require patients to have specific symptoms, such as pain or stiffness, and positive examination findings, such as a restricted range of motion. And altogether, these three findings are necessary to diagnose FAI. Now, there's two major shortcomings of this diagnostic symptom system. Firstly, the consequences of CAM and pincer lesions are vastly different. They're very, very different pathologies. In actual fact, one seems to increase the risk of arthritis and one reduces the risk. And they have very, very different restrictions on hip range of motion. And grouping them together under the umbrella of FAI risks its overlooking these important distinctions. And secondly, the risk of long-term osteoarthritis can be present even in the absence of pain, which means you don't actually fulfill the diagnostic criteria for FAI. So if we're relying on the diagnosis of FAI to predict an increased risk of osteoarthritis, we're potentially missing an opportunity to intervene earlier. So let's take a closer look at pincer lesions. So they basically reflect a deepening of the hip socket. And you can see them here, both on CT and X-ray. And this deep hip socket predisposes to irritation of the cartilage around the periphery of the hip socket called the acetabular labrum. And this usually occurs when it gets impinged on by the femoral neck, typically at extreme ranges of motion, such as we see in ballet dancers or gymnasts. But while a pincer deformity can increase the risk of labral irritation, it actually seems to protect against hip arthritis. And this study found that pincer morphology reduced the risk of developing end-stage arthritis of the hip by about 65%. And this makes sense because a fuller hip socket will actually spread force over a larger area, and this will actually reduce the peak forces on the articular cartilage. So on balance, while pincer morphology may increase the risk of labral irritation, it likely reduces the risk of long-term hip osteoarthritis. And most athletes with pincer morphology will do very well simply by restricting the end range of motion. CAM lesions, however, are a completely different beast. So you can see the bump here on the anterosuperior aspect of the femoral neck, which is characteristic of a CAM lesion. And these bumps cause a loss of sphericity of the femoral head, and they can damage the labrum and articular cartilage when they're moved into the joint, essentially causing osteoarthritis of the hip. And CAM deformities are typically measured on X-ray using something we call the alpha angle. So a line connecting the center of the femoral head and the center of the femoral neck is intersected with a line drawn towards the point at which the bump begins. And the angle between these two lines represents the alpha angle. And a larger angle represents a more significant CAM lesion. And any alpha angle over 60 degrees is likely to be pathological. You can see here the bimodal distribution of alpha angles with the grouping on the left representing a normal distribution of healthy hips and the population on the right, those with CAM pathology. And alpha angles over 60 degrees increase the risk of developing hip arthritis significantly by about seven times, in fact. And if the alpha angle's over 83 degrees, that increases to about 17 times. And this also applies to young adults. This study looked at cartilage thickness and alpha angle and found that in a group of athletes with a mean age of only 24, there was a strong inverse correlation. And this finding holds true even when symptoms are absent.
even when the diagnostic criteria for FAI is not met, the risk of arthritis of the hip is significantly increased. So then the question arises, if CAM lesions are so bad, can we do anything to prevent them? And the simple answer is yes, with load management. You see, CAM lesions arise from excessive stress to open growth plates in the femoral head. And Siebenrock demonstrated that a high level of athletic activity when the growth plate was open led to the abnormal extension of this growth plate down along the femoral neck. And as it fuses with skeletal maturity, it leads to abnormal bone formation on the anterosuperior aspect of the femoral neck, which is where CAM lesions occur. So if you have a look at this MRI, you can see the abnormal extension of the growth plate coming down towards the femoral neck, and it's apparent that if it widens, as growth plates tend to do when they're placed under excessive stress, it can lead to a deformity that's consistent with a CAM lesion. And because it's a problem of open growth plates, CAM lesions are only a problem in the skeletally immature. And this paper documented CAM regrowth following surgical resection, comparing it to between those who were skeletally immature with open growth plates and those who were mature with closed growth plates. And they found a regrowth rate rate of 15% if you're skeletally mature, and no occurrences if you're, sorry, skeletally immature, and no occurrences if you're skeletally mature. So clearly, a CAM deformity is a problem of excessing loading to an open growth plate, which only occurs when you're skeletally immature. And these growth plates are most vulnerable during periods of rapid growth. And it's no coincidence that these periods of rapid growth is when the peak injury rate to growth plates occur. And the risk of CAM development and progression is also highest about this period, between about 10 and 15 years old. So one strategy we have is to carefully measure the height of young athletes every three months to identify these periods of rapid growth. And once we identify it, we should modify their training loads, reducing it and delaying any skill progression. And even outside periods of peak growth, excessively repetitive movements should be avoided. We can use a variety of drills and emphasise the quality of workouts rather than the quantity. And more specifically, athletes in several sports such as soccer, such as basketball, if they train more than three times a week, they have a significantly higher risk of developing CAM lesions. And this is even worse if they engage in year-round sporting participation. So as a guide, growing athletes should not train more than three times a week, and year-round participation should be discouraged. But as therapists, many of you here are in a position to identify issues early, both through periodic physical examination and symptom monitoring. And this can permit early treatment, which is primarily relative rest, and hopefully lead to better longer term outcomes. But of course, we can't prevent every case of hip pain. And when we have a patient turning up to our clinic saying they've got hip or groin pain, how do we determine if it's a problem of FAI? So history-wise, most patients with FAI will come in reporting the gradual onset of activity-related pain, and some describe sharper symptoms if the labrum is involved. They may even make this C sign when they describe their pain, which often indicates hip joint pathology. But unfortunately, hip pathology and symptoms is not usually this clear cut. And hip-related pain may extend from anywhere from the lower back all the way down to the calf or the shin. Furthermore, other structures such as facet joints can refer pain in exactly the same areas, as can the lumbosacral nerve roots. And this, is, this can be very diagnostically challenging, especially considering that hip and lumbar pathology often coexists, in part due to their connectedness within the kinematic chain, meaning that a restriction in one region will often lead to an increased stress on the adjacent region. So the most sensitive test we have clinically for hip joint pathology is probably the FIDIA, or flexion, adduction, and internal rotation test. And that's about 90% sensitive, meaning it will only miss 10% of cases of pain coming from the hip joint. But this is only for hip joint pathology in general, not FAI specifically. And the sensitivity reduces to about 60% when we're looking at FAI in this condition. And even then, it is only about 50% specific which means it's still a flip of the coin, even if you have a positive test. But generally speaking, the FIDIA test is a reasonable test to exclude the hip as a source of pain. But for 
asymptomatic CAM lesions, which predispose to osteoarthritis of the hip, I believe the best test is a measurement of internal rotation in sitting. So if we have a look at this here, which is a top-down view of the hip in extension, and you can see the anterior bump represented on the femoral head, it's obvious how internal rotation will bring that towards the joint and potentially block the movement. And this is why a restricted range of internal rotation is a very useful measure for cam lesions. And this is borne out in the research, and it indicates that the risk of developing end-stage arthritis of the hip increases by about 10 times if you have an internal rotation range of less than 20 degrees. And if we add to this the alpha angle, the risk increases to more than 50 times. So clearly, the assessment of internal rotation is a very good clinical indication for CAM morphology. But even with these tests, we, it can be difficult to clinically determine whether the hip is a source of pain. And this is where diagnostic injections can be very helpful. So relief of symptoms following injection of local anaesthetic will confirm the hip as a source of pain. And we can also inject corticosteroid at the same time, which is great for settling down an irritated joint. And don't forget that these injections can also be used to target facet joints and nerve roots of the lumbar spine, which can also help us making our diagnosis. But once we've diagnosed FAI or a CAM lesion, what can a therapist do? Well, quite a bit, actually. So first of all, understand that CAM morphology is a problem of distorted anatomy. It cannot be corrected without surgery. So therapy should focus on accommodation and adaptation. Any repetitive movements that bring the CAM into the joint should be avoided. For instance, the traditional impairment-based therapy program focusing on restricted range of motion might actually encourage repetitive internal rotation to try and restore that range. But clearly, that's just going to be increasing the joint wear. So instead, you should help patients find alternative movements that respect their bony anatomy and avoid the internalization of this cam lesion into the joint. So if we have a look at the pelvis, you can see that the acetabular wall is deeper anteriorly than it is out laterally. So abducting the thigh when flexing will actually allow more room for a cam lesion. So here you can see this demonstrated with the range of hip flexion being greater when the thigh is abducted in abduction, and it reduces as the thigh is brought towards the midline. And you can also see the point where hip flexion seems to be optimal. And we can incorporate this into function, so we might actually use this to find an optimal hip position for a squat, for instance. We can also assess functional hip flexion in 4.0. We get the patient to come back onto their heels while trying to maintain the lumbar lordosis. And the point at which the spine starts to flex gives us an idea of the functional range of the hip. And as before, this range will usually be greater in degrees of hip abduction, and we can experiment with different widths of the knees to find an optimal posture. Now clearly, not every hip socket is the same when it comes to accommodating a cam lesion and some will accommodate it much better than others. And it's actually said that on average, Eastern Europeans have shallower hip sockets than other demographics, and this affords for a greater range of hip flexion. And this is probably one reason why this demographic is so good at weightlifting, because they can come down into a full squat, relying primarily on hip flexion and sparing the lumbar spine of the flexion. It probably also explains the very high rate of developmental dysplasia of the hip in this population. But if we come back to somebody with a restricted range of hip motion because of a cam lesion, we can give them advice. So we might ask them to lift off blocks to reduce the degree of hip flexion required or to modify their stance to a wider stance to better accommodate the cam lesion. Another example might be somebody who's got restricted midline flexion who finds it difficult to ride a bike, but they might tolerate running very well. We can also modify the ADL. Somebody who might have pain from the persistent hip flexion when they're driving might get benefit from just reclining their car seat back. Otherwise, we might be able to teach them a lunge squat technique, which you can see here um, prevents any hip flexion on the right, and that also spares the lumbar spine of excessive flexion. So overall, a combined approach of judicious injections, careful movement assessment, education, and retraining is usually effective at improving the symptoms and function, and often for a prolonged period.
that there often reaches a point where a surgeon may need to be called upon. Unfortunately, the role of surgery in early FAI is poorly defined, and resection of CAM lesions has not proven to reduce the progression to osteoarthritis, and some authorities feel it may even accelerate joint degeneration. And there's some evidence that treatment of isolated labral lesions may provide short-term benefit, but there's no convincing longer-term data. So given that at least 30% of patients who undergo surgery have a poor outcome, any decision to proceed with surgery should be taken with caution. But when it comes to the treatment of advanced osteoarthritis, the story is different. The total hip replacement is a very successful operation, and it should be considered when quality of life is being adversely affected. In fact, many patients, especially the younger patients, are now having hips replaced and doing many things their surgeons would no doubt disapprove of, such as running half marathons and rock climbing. Now, we certainly don't have good longer-term data on the consequences of doing this, but there's many individuals in this Facebook group who have been active for many years doing this kind of thing and seem to be doing well. So in closing, I'd like to leave you with a few take-home points. CAM morphology should be considered a risk for osteoarthritis, irrespective of whether it's associated with pain. Load management in the younger athlete is critical to preventing the formation of CAM lesions in the first place. And while both the FIDIA test and measurement of internal rotation can be useful in the clinical examination, nothing will trump a diagnostic injection. And once you've diagnosed a pincer morphology, you may only need to restrict the patient's range of motion, whereas in those with CAM lesions, you should avoid any repetitive movement which brings the CAM lesion into the joint. Thank you.